Hello everyone, um, my name's Stuart Knox and welcome to the 11th The Real Review Live. Well, my first The Real Review Live. Um, I believe there's uh, 50 plus participants in this one, so looking forward to uh, spending the next bit of time with you talking about some wines, answering some questions. Um, I believe many of you have ordered wines from the wineries. Um, if you want to order any of these wines, you can go to the Real Review website and click on the link of cellar door to door and the wineries, you'll order direct from the wineries and they'll put some special packs together for you. Um, today, we're gonna to look at Christmas wines. Uh, so a different theme to uh, variety or place. This is, this is a really interesting pack to put together because we all look forward to Christmas, but Christmas day can have its uh, stresses. So we've got to get some things organised prior. So I like to have a good, good mix, mixed dozen of wines ready to go for Christmas Day. Um, this way we can cover all things. We can cover the oysters and the prawns that we started with all the way through to the big roast beef that we finished with and even the Christmas cake. Um, it'll keep you happy. It'll keep your mum and dad happy. It'll keep your kids happy if they're old enough to drink. Even, even your cranky aunt, she'll probably be happy with a few of these wines as well. A um, couple of things as well. We've got a couple of events coming up. Um, there was a Vino Social Shardy Party, but that's already sold out. So sorry if you missed out on that. But if you want to get in fast, we're going to be doing another Vino Social in December um, on the 9th. Um, once again, a bit of a Christmas theme. So get in touch, see with uh, the Real Review and see if they uh, can slot you in for that. Details still to be confirmed. Uh, if you are in New Zealand, there's a dinner with Bob on, in Auckland in late November as well. Uh, the format for today, I'm going to taste these wines with you guys. We're going to talk through them a little bit. I'm going to taste a couple of wines, then take a couple of questions, and on we go from there. So I hope you enjoy the next uh, hour or so with me, and um, I hope you enjoy these wines. Now, we're going to start off with... Uh, the Longview Riesling 2020 from uh, their Macclesfield Riesling. It's uh, used to be called the Knob Hill, if you've seen it before. Now, I'm a big fan of Riesling, so those of you that know me would already know that. But yes, Riesling is probably my number one go-to. So, and this is this is what exactly what I'd look for in a Riesling. It's got that lovely pale lemon straw color, a lovely bit of greenish to the edge as well. So very bright, youthful, vibrant. There's a lovely lemon pith and a lime curd characteristics on the nose. A nice little bit of um, crust oyster shell and sort of uh, sea spray in there as well. I have a little, little sip. Lovely energy to this wine. There's a real, there's a real drive and purpose to it. It's a, it's, it's almost relentless in its drive through to the back palate. Lovely high tone of acid, uh, those lemon lime characteristics, and a beautiful crushed shell, savoury saline sort of character in there as well, which makes me want to keep going back for more and more. Um, Longview Vineyard has been around. They were they was planted in the early 2000s. Um, the two brothers and have now got their sister and mum and dad involved in it as well. Uh, beautiful property. It's got everything going for it. They've got the classics planted, the Chardonnays, the Pinots, the Rieslings, but they do have a bit of an Italian bent as well. They, uh, they've got quite a lot of Italian varieties planted there and a beautiful restaurant, place to stay as well. So it's certainly worth a visit to if you're ever up in the Adelaide Hills to go and check out Longview. They've done a fantastic job there. Now this wine we've ranked at 91 points and that's a lovely silver ribbon for the Longview Riesling. It's uh, ranked at number 15 of 31 Rieslings from the Mount Lofty Ranges on the Real Review website. So it's a really good good glass of Riesling. $30 so it's certainly a reasonable price to you and you're getting a lot of bang for your buck there. So a lovely wine. Now the wineries suggested this would uh, go well with a Thai beef salad, a spicy one at that. And I'd certainly agree with that. The, uh, 
the acid line will really help cut through the sort of spice and the chili. But this wine does have enough stuffing in the middle palate that it'll certainly be able to stand up to the, the weight of the beef. A um, little um, green papaya in that salad and some green herbs as well would lift up some of those lemon and lime flavours that are noticing in the wine as well. Delicious drop. Okay, now we'll move along. Second wine in the lineup today is the Hunkerford Hill Blackberry Vineyard Semillon, 2013 vintage. It's from the Hunter Valley. Um, Hungerford Hill have been in the Hunter Valley. They were set up in the mid 60s um, by the Parker family. Um, we know the Parker family in the wine trade probably more famously because of Parker Estate in the Coonawarra, and that is the same family. They um, they left the Hunter Valley but uh, settled down at Parker Estate instead. Um, couple of changes of ownership, but uh, James Kirby in the early 2000s took the reins and really pushed it forward and set Hungerford Hill up on the path that they're now enjoying as well. He sold the business a few years back um, and they've got a wonderful winemaker, Brian Curry, who's doing some fantastic things there. Um, also now under the Hungerford Hill banner, they have also purchased the Sweetwater and the um, Dalwood Vineyard. So there's even more focus on great Hunter Valley wines coming through underneath, underneath Brian's winemaking. And uh, there'll be some spectacular wines in the future. Now, Hunter Semillon is an amazing wine. It really ages fantastically well. And it uh, is one of those unique things of Australia. It's really, really special. So let's have a little look at this one. Still amazingly youthful in its colour. Definitely a pale straw colour, but there's still those lovely green tinges, which is amazing for a wine that's seven years old. On the nose, it's just starting to get those beautiful characters that Hunter Valley wines get as they develop. Certainly not, not ageing particularly fast or furious. It's certainly only just starting to show a little bit of our beeswax and sort of lemon curd on sourdough toast there. Beautiful, very aromatic though. It's just leaping out of the glass, this wine. I tell you what, if it's Christmas lunch and you have this with some uh, freshly peeled prawns and a bit, lovely bit of rosemary sauce, that'd be, that'd be happy days. Everyone in the family is going to enjoy that. On the palate, there's just beautiful weight and texture through the middle, but it's not, it doesn't sit heavy, it sits light. The acid and the little bit of phenolics giving it some little fuzz and crunch around the outside gives it plenty of air and really it resonates around the palate. There's lots of flavour and texture and lots of layers going on. A beautiful sort of nutty, nutty characteristic um, as well, just which is coming from the, coming from the bit of bottle development. Um, now, this wine was uh, scored at 95, 100, so it's a gold gold ribbon, and it's uh, a top rank wine, number 13 of 53 for the 2013 uh, Semillons from the Lower Hunter Valley. And, and whilst I was talking about prawns before, this one um, for Brian, he reckons pan-fried whiting would go well with this, and certainly I wouldn't say no to some pan-fried whiting either. Um, if a big Christmas lunch, I'm not sure I could be doing enough whiting to feed the family of uh, 15 or 20 but I tell you what it'd be a fantastic he said with some butter and a herb salad and I like that idea as well the green herbs would really lift some of those lemon curd characteristics in there as well a fantastic wine and really an excellent example of what Hunter Semion does and that ability to age this would would age happily we've given a window window up till 2027 and I think it would still be singing beyond that now we'll take a couple of questions here. Um, Susan, what are the noticeable differences between Hunter Semion and Barossa Semion? Uh, interesting, it's uh, obviously they're probably the two main regions growing uh, Semion in Australia. Generally, I find the Barossa ones have a little bit more breadth in the palate, a little bit more weighty. They tend to lean towards more stone fruits um, and a bit more apples and pears, pardon me, whilst the 
Hunter Valley tends to be more about lemon lime and a bit of pea shoots as well. I do find the Hunter Valley Semions because they seem to retain a little bit more acidity, really age a lot longer than the Barossa Semions. Uh, but the Barossa Semions are still very much age worthy, but just not to the same, not to the same length that the Hunter Valley Semions can do. And um, question from Terence: What makes Riesling my favourite wine? Uh, well, because you know, because it does everything really. Uh, Riesling for me is a really is a variety that just translates its place really well. It uh, it doesn't allow for a lot of winemaking artifact. It's all about where the grape is grown, and it really really brings out the flavour of the ground and the place, the sense of terroir, as it were. And it can give you so many different styles as well, from really tight, bright, minerally styles like we've got here with the long view, um, through to rich botrytis styles that we see around the world, the, the Moselle Rieslings, low alcohol, very high, high acid, but with some sweetness as well. And then we go into Austria where they're much a much broader, richer, more powerful, but dry. So there's just... There's nothing Riesling can't do, frankly. That's my, my excuse anyway. Good question, Terence. Okay. Well, moving along now. Now, I'm a bit spoiled today because I've got a selection of glassware as well, so I can roll into the Chardonnay glass for the Chardonnays. And we've got the Stonia... Wines KBS Vineyard Chardonnay 2019. It's from the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria. Stony is one of the one of the early starters down in the uh, Mornington Peninsula. They uh, they have driven the the quality level of Chardonnay and Pinot from that region um, to the tops top uh, top echelon and been a really big driver of that sort of quality program. They were the, um, they set up a tasting program which was called SIPNOT, the Stonia International Pinot Noir Tasting Panels. And that would be tasting panels of Pinots from not only Mornington, but from around Australia and the world, bringing in some of the great winemakers and the great wine experts, the James Halliday's, the winemakers from Burgundy and panel tastings and discussions over a couple of days probably the most comprehensive and certainly the most impressive Pinot line of Pinot, lineup of Pinot Noir in a tasting situation that I've ever had the joy to enjoy. So they're really driving not only their winery's quality, not only their region's quality, but the whole, the whole country's quality in Pinot production. Um, and Chardonnay is in the same boat. So let's have a little look. Lovely colour, pale straw fully coloured through to the rim, not no golden tones there at all. There's still just a nice little hint of green there as well. So it's a, it's a cracking looking wine. On the nose, real intense savoury characteristic, really, really intense savouries. Now, if we're talking Christmas lunch, this is, this is the one I'd probably be thinking about the, the roast turkey. I reckon the roast turkey in this one would be a uh, absolute winner for that one. It's the nose. There's there's a real sort of grilled nuts. There's um, spices, curry leaf, and underneath there's some really powerful stone fruits as well. Now, make no mistake, this is a big wine. This is a very big, a powerhouse. There's so much concentration of, of fruit in the middle palate, but what I really like what they've done here is that they've laid winemaking techniques without them being obvious to give you a lot of savoury, to balance that sort of fruit intensity. So there's a really tight line of acid which keeps it keeps it fresh and driving, but there's a little bit of phenolics around the outside just to give you some deeper textures. Um, those roast nuts and there's also cashews. There's almost a toffee, burnt toffee, but not in a sweetness. It's almost like a salted caramel sort of characteristic there as well. But to me, this wine is 
not just about those flavors, but it's about that presence on the palate. And it's a, it's certainly a blockbuster. This is this one will sort of stop the conversation at the at the Christmas lunch table for sure with its with its persistence. So this wine. I'm obviously really enjoying, and we've rated that at 96 out of 100, so that's a really good score, a gold ribbon performance there. And uh, top top rank wine as well, number two out of 53 for the 29, 2019 sorry, Chardonnays from uh, the Port Phillip region of Mornington. Uh, easily a 10-year window for drinking this one. It's a lovely wine, and with time it will certainly give you a lot of drinking pleasure if you can keep your hands off what you've bought for Christmas Day. Food-wise, I talked about the, the roast turkey and um, the winemakers suggesting maybe a kingfish sashimi with sesame ponzu dressing, which I can see as well. That'd be probably a really nice dish for the Christmas, Christmas lunch, a bit lighter, not quite so um, hot and heady in the kitchen doing the kingfish sashimi. It's uh, and with that sesame, it would pick up those roast nuts and ponzu, if you don't know, is a Japanese citrus. So that'd pick up that nice acid line as well. So that'd be a lovely combination there in, in with that one as well. Okay. Another Chardonnay, because let's face it, you can't have too much Chardonnay. Chardonnay is probably, uh, this might be a controversial opinion, but I think in Australia, our, one of our, our best performing varieties at the moment is Chardonnay. We're doing a cracking job and right up there with the rest of the world in, in terms of quality Chardonnay production. So this is the Giant Steps Sexton Vineyard Chardonnay 2019. It's from the Yarra Valley in Victoria. Um, Giant Steps was set up by uh, Phil Sexton. Um, Phil's a bit of a man about town when it comes to beverage production. He was uh, one of the founders of Devil's Lair in Margaret River. Uh, he also set up Matilda Bay Brewing and he also set up Little Creatures Brewing. So he's had a little, it, they say it takes a lot of beer to make wine. And so he's covered all the bases there in the beer production and the wine production there. Um, the head winemaker at um, Giant Steps is Steve Flamsteed. Um, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, a real deep thinker, quiet, but really, really goes about his business and produces some fantastic wines. Steve's also a chef. He's a qualified chef. He did his full apprenticeship. Um, he's travelled to France to make cheese. He got a Queen's scholarship to make cheese. So it's pretty much nothing Steve can't do. He plays plays um, plays in a, the band in the Arrow Valley called the Yeasty Boys as well and does quite a good job in that as well. So he's certainly a man of many talents. Let's have a look at this wine. Once again, it's got that lovely, lovely bright straw colour. Very fresh nose, this one. This is probably more, more, more lighter, a little more air in it, um, sort of lemon curd, lemon pith. Underneath, there's a nice sort of um, bitter almond note as well, just a bit of winemaking technique, a bit of oak coming through. But very restrained, very fine indeed. A little taste of this one. Um, a lovely finesse to this wine. It sits high in the palate. It's like airy. It's like it's got, it sort of floats across the tongue. Um, acid drives it and it sits there with those lovely lemon and lime zest characteristics and then drops as it further goes into the back palate drops into a more sort of uh, a more crisp nut characteristic but not not to the level of the the previous one this is more of a, a more finesse probably a, a narrower more focused palate without that breadth there but st it's a, such a lovely wine um There's a real, there is a real persistence to it though as well. It certainly carries very long into the palate. Um, this one we rated 95 points, so that's a gold ribbon wine as well. A top rank and number four of 25 of Chardonnays from the Yarra Valley. Uh, 
Steve loves to drink this particular wine with um, a roast organic chook, uh, thyme and garlic, and certainly that, uh, that roast chook element, like I was talking about the roast turkey before, I think that would be a lovely combination. It's, um, it's also for the, your aunt that says they never drink Chardonnay, that might be the one to pour them because it's not that big, rich, oaky style of Chardonnay. So might be a good contrast there. We've got a couple of questions here. Um, Victoria, how important is glassware when drinking wine? Well, I suppose first first thought, of course, was we need a glass. To, well, we can drink out of the bottle, but preferably you drink out of a glass. Um, I think the first port of call is good glassware, so a nice thin stem. That's that's my first thin, thin lip, sorry. Um, that's my first port of call. Um, I would rather have one nice glass or a set of one shape nice glasses than have some big rough and ready sort of ones. Um, having said that, if you can have a couple of different shapes, it does make a big difference. I'm, I am a big believer in different shapes suiting different varieties. Uh, there's, a, there's probably a whole live seminar on that one, but I won't go into it too much now, but certainly the way the glass delivers the wine onto your palate, the way the aromatics sit in the glass, those things are affected by the shape of the glass. So I, I tend to have at least three shapes in my cupboard at home, as long as I don't break too many in the dishwasher. Uh, ben, um, please come in an oak in Chardonnay and uh, the two Chardonnays you've tasted have oak, if so, how many months? Um, first part, of, I'll, I'll answer that question backwards. I don't know how many months in oak these ones have sat. Uh, they're 2019, so they've, I would say, somewhere between six and nine months, but I don't know that for a fact, so that's just me guessing. But, yes, they both will have seen oak. Um, nowadays, very few Chardonnays are made completely unoaked, but there's a a much different perception of the use of oak. So a lot of winemakers are using much larger format barrels, which reduces the oak characteristic in there. Uh, they are also using a lot more old barrels as opposed to new barrels. So a oak barrel that's brand new will impart a much more oaky characteristic than an oak barrel that's four or five years old. So those four and five years old will give you more... Um, more depth and texture without those obvious oak flavours coming through. Okay, so we'll move along for now. We're going to go into some Pinot Noir, sticking with the Yarra Valley. Why am I putting that there for We've got the Coldstream Hills Deer Farm Pinot Noir 2019 from the Yarra Valley. Um, Coldstream, as I'm sure many of you know, but the Coldstream was the vineyard that um, James Halliday set up in the Yarra Valley. Um, not not one of the first vineyards there, but certainly one of the ones to really put it on the map, particularly when it comes to Chardonnay and Pinot. James has a love for Burgundy, and so that's what he was uh, going for at this particular place. And Coldstream has been a sort of a, a sounding board for many winemakers over the, over the years of a place to go and learn about winemaking and obviously a lot of the wine trade going through there and tasting some pretty amazing wines from James's cellar. And so certainly it sits in the upper echelon of Australian wine production, particularly in the Pinot Noir and Chardonnay zone. Uh, this is from the Deer Farm Vineyard, which is a little higher altitude than where the vineyard sits. Um, a lot of the Arrow Valley now is moving to those upper areas for their Chardonnay and Pinot Noir looking more to the valley floor for Shiraz and Cabernet and those sort of fuller bodied varieties. So let's have a look at this one. Pinot Noir is one of those varieties that can come in a variety, of, like it, you'll see a lot of different colours in the glass. Doesn't really necessarily mean it's lighter or fuller depending on the, on the intensity of the colour. Um, what I do look for in my Pinots though is that the colour is consistent right to the rim. And this is exactly that. It's got a lovely ruby colour, a little bit of purpling there, but it just flows right through the rim, no watery edges on that. On the nose, 
lovely cherry characteristic, dark cherries. There's a nice little bit of chocolate there as well. There's a, a bit of spice there as well, like a, a cinnamon, a little wood spice there. It smells, it smells delicious. On the palate. Plenty of ripe fruit on the entry. Once again, black cherries, um, a little blackberry in there as well. Then it rolls through the middle palate and it's very taut. Like the acid line is really quite driven on this one. Uh, and then the tannins quite, quite firm on the sides. It all, it all flows though, it's really well polished. There's no, there's no edges on this wine at all. Even though there's, you can feel that tension, it is well, well and truly professionally put together. Um, very youthful. It's gonna take a long time for this wine to start showing some of those sort of more savory forest floor characteristics, but I think over time they'll certainly come out. It's a really, really well polished wine. Now we've given this a rank of 94 out of 100, which is a very high silver ribbon. Uh, it's a top rank wine, so and it's number five of 41 from the 2019 Pinots from the Yarra Valley. Um, drinking window, we've popped it down from 21 to 2032. And I think that's right. Another year in bottle, we'll start to see some of those more savory elements creep out, which would be great. There's a nice dried herb character. I'd like that to really lift out a bit more. Um, so maybe maybe with this one, if you're going to have it for this Christmas, get it open. I don't normally decant Pinots, but that one could do with a little decant for a couple of uh, couple of hours beforehand. And if you're doing a if you're doing a uh, glazed ham, I reckon that'd be the one to be drinking with that. Maybe even pop it pop the decanter in the fridge for 20 minutes before you serve it, just to bring it down a couple of degrees from the traditional Australian Christmas room temperature. A lovely wine though, a lovely wine. Uh, with that one as well, from the, from I've talked about the ham, I talked to the winery as well. They're talking about a duck breast there. And I think well, Pinot and duck is a fantastic Fantastic combination. Um, they've gone with a balsamic vinegar and berry glaze um, and in-season vegetables. The in-season vegetables would really pick up more of those savoury, those sort of vegetable forest floor tones. And the berry glaze and the balsamic would really match up nicely with that acid and tannin profile as well. So, yep, I can certainly see that uh, duck and balsamic vinegar combo going really well. That would be delicious. Duck's always delicious. Okay. Now, the next wine off the list is the Toby Becker's McLaren Vale Grenache 2008 from South Australia, McLaren Vale, of course. And um, Toby and his wife, Emmanuel, are really passionate about the McLaren Vale and their belief that as a region, they can produce some of the great wines of the world. Uh, Toby's been a viticulturist for many years and has worked in the McLaren Vale for many wineries. And uh, Emmanuel is a, a winemaker from France and both living out here now as well. But I met Toby was be five or six years ago, uh, I think maybe four or five years ago, when he was bringing out his first wine, first release and they were only releasing one wine which was a McLaren Vale Grenache which at the time was a bit uh, controversial and certainly left of centre um, as it's turned out it was a very good idea because Grenache seems to be the perfect variety for McLaren Vale. Um, I'm leaving this one in a Pinot glass because I like the aromatics that the Pinot glass lets brings out in Grenache as well. Um, so let's have a little look. There's a lovely depth of colour there, a really deep ruby. Once again, the colour goes all the way to the rim, no, no fading to the edge at all. Now the nose is just so fragrant and beautiful. There's, there's, it's like a forest, a basket of uh, forest fruits, blueberries and blackberries and raspberries. There's a nice little bit of um, uh, mocha in there as well and some 
mountain herbs, lavender, those sort of things, really just very powerful and lifted and fragrant on the palate. Those, those forest fruits come through on the palate. They just flow and roll. It's like a tsunami of, of flavour coming through the palate. It fills all the nooks and crannies, but at the same time, it's not overbearing. It, it, does, that with, so it does it with such poise. There's beautiful tannins. They are firm but guiding, and they just carry everything rolling along. There's a, a length and a drive to it, which is which is truly remarkable it's still going and going and going in my palate it's um it's a beautiful wine and it's got so much so much power yet so much elegance as well it's a it's a real i love that contrast and that tension between that that presence yet delicacy that's a fantastic wine and um, and we have rated this one at 96 out of 100 so that's a very nice gold ribbon for that one it is a top rank wine again it is ranked number one of 65 2018 grenaches from mclaren vale uh, emmanuel and toby have suggested maybe some peking duck or some chinese barbecue pork with this one which would be beautiful particularly the chinese barbecue pork i love that that idea of the, the sweetness of the char sweet, picking up the sweet red berries that I see in the wine, yet those tannins and that acid line and that drive and power would really work beautifully alongside that richness of the fatty pork there as well. Um, if you're doing a pork leg roast or a, something like that, this wine would be fantastic with that as well. And you can almost dip the crackling in that as a bit of a special treat. Okay, now we're going to take a couple of questions. I'll just concentrate on pouring that glass out so I don't make a mess. Okay. Uh, Ruth, uh, what wine variety would you recommend with my traditional turkey and cranberry sauce? Well, cranberry does add a little bit of uh, tension to the, the, the match. Um, turkey, I tend to lean towards maybe a Chardonnay, but as soon as you get cranberry... I'm leaning towards more of a Pinot Noir or maybe a Gamay. A, 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 a chilled red would be fantastic. So a Gamay, um, we don't have one on this lineup, but I think a Gamay would be a really nice combination with a cranberry sauce. Um, that, that's probably the way I'd go. There's some beautiful Gamays coming out of the Mornington Peninsula as well. Um, Susan, what's your preference of Chardonnay, Mornington or Yarra Valley? Oh, I'm going to get in trouble if I answer that one, Susan. It's like picking a favourite child. It just depends on the day. Look, I, I like both regions for different reasons. I do find that the Yarra provides uh, a slightly lighter, a fresher, more driven style, whereas the Mornington tends to tends towards a slightly fuller, richer style. So I do. it depends on what I'm looking for. If I'm looking for the sort of the nice soft comfort that is a, a big rich Chardonnay or lo looking for something with a little more zip and zing. And then I'd look at the Yarra Valley. Um, now it's moving along to wine number seven, which is the Flowstone Cabernet Sauvignon Toriga from the Margaret River in WA. It's a 2015 vintage. At Christmas Day, it's always nice to have a couple of wines as well that have got a bit of bottle age on them. Um, just it doesn't all have to be yesterday's wines. Now, Flowstone, um, a small little winery, um, playing around with some interesting blends. Uh, Stuart Pyme, you'd know uh, some of his previous wineries that he'd set up, were, um, notably um, Stella Bella and uh, Suck Fizzle, uh, two memorable names and quite memorable labels. So he's gone out and uh, with another business partner to do this. They've planted the traditional Cabernet and Shiraz, but having a bit of fun as well with a little Tariga thrown in on the side. Um, let's have a little look at this. Nice deep colour. Uh, once again, all the way to the rim. Five years bottle age and it's not showing really any, 
any fading or browning on that rim. So it's certainly got, it looks like it's got plenty of time in it. <clears throat> on the nose, on the nose, it certainly shows the Cabernet characteristic. There's lovely tobacco leaf and mulberries and blackberries there. There's a nice, nice little bit of sort of uh, cedar cigar box there as well. And there's some savory spices coming through as it as I swirl as well. Almost a, a seaside sort of uh, wakami, sort of nori, sort of um, seaweed note there as well. Now let's have a little look on the palette. Now on the palette, you can feel the, the presence that it's, it's focused on the Cabernet. The Cabernet is the driving force here. Beautiful, quite firm tannins, reminding me more like a, like a, a, a Northern Hemisphere Cabernet uh, with that sort of quite drying tannins, but, and still light of, light of foot around the outside. But the Tariga adds a really unique sort of weight, a, like a lovely dollop of sort of dark and spicy fruit in the middle. So it just keeps it flowing beautifully. Cabernet can be somewhat donut-like. It can leave a little hole in the palate. And I think in this wine, they've used the Tariga really well to fill that middle part, yet let the Cabernet, the quality of the Cabernet that they're clearly growing at this vineyard and as Margaret River does really sing through. Uh, a beautiful wine that really, if you're de roasting a leg of lamb, with some rosemary and some garlic, maybe even some anchovies to get that seaside characteristic for Christmas day. I think that'd be, that would be a fantastic one there. I'm really, I really do find this a lovely contra, like sort of tension between some new world brightness of fruit. And then there's a, a slightly old world savory element there. That's really, really appeals to me. Um, we rated this as 95 points, so a gold ribbon there. It ranks, it's top ranked number two of 29 Cabernet blends in the 2015 vintage from Margaret River. And uh, window drinking window of now till 2030. And I'd certainly say that this has got plenty of time. Those, that little bit of acid and certainly that, uh, that tannin structure will give it ample time to keep aging. A lovely wine. Now, food-wise, I've talked about if you're on Christmas, you'd be looking at maybe maybe a roast lamb or something like that. The winery has suggested maybe a duck cassoulet with seasonal vegetables, which I love as well. I'm leaning, as I'm talking about Bordeaux and we're talking about duck cassoulet, which is a classic dish from that southwest region of France, I can see that working really well. The sort of spices there picking up the tariga and the tannins coming through that fatty richness that you get from the duck confit and the, the um, Toulouse sausage and all of those lovely things in the cassoulet. So that would be a wonderful, wonderful combination. Okay, I'm just going to tip that one out there. Now, now... Final wine of the lineup is the Kaisler, the Bogan Shiraz 2018 from the Barossa Valley in South Australia. The only wine on tonight that's under cork. Lots of screw caps these days. Uh, Kaisler um, is uh, Reed Bosworth. Um, they've been around since uh, the late 1800s and it actually stayed in the Kaysler family until the early 1980s. And uh, a few ownership changes following through, but then um, Reed has taken it over um, about 20 odd years ago and is taken it from strength to strength. They've got some amazing old vineyards. Um, the Bogan is a mix of their old vineyard, which is planted in 1899, and they're one of the youngest planted vineyards, which was planted in 1965. So old and older, really. Um, so amazing, amazing uh, old vine material for them to work with. So let's have a look. And as you'd expect from Barossa Shiraz, um, 
inky, staining the glass, really deep, deep colour, um, opaque, deep ruby colour, some purpling on the edges there too. Now, the thing about, I really always appreciate about uh, Reed's wines is that whilst they are unashamedly Barossa and they're big in their, in their presence and weight and sort of character, they're not overcooked. They're not, there's no stewy characters. The nose on this is still purple fruits like plums and blueberries and raspberries and there's some dried herbs and some, even some violets in there as well. So it's intense, but it's not, there's, no, there's no sort of overdone characteristics. I really, really love the aromatics on this. It's really quite intriguing. There's a lovely sort of almost a, a dry earth characteristic as well. On the palate, that, that presence that Reed gives in in real life too, is there. Like it's quite rich. It fills, it's mouth filling and it's velvety. It's almost oily in its texture, but he has a deft touch. So whilst you get this really concentration, this almost explosion of flavor at the front palate, it then softens and rolls gently through to the finish. There's certainly no, no sort of overt sort of in your face characteristics that stick out. It just rolls along beautifully, flows. There's, a, there's some nice savoury herbal elements in there that sit underneath that, that big, ripe, powerful fruit. For mind, maybe that it doesn't quite have the carry of some of the wines we've had, but it's certainly it's a big glass of wine and it's a big, impressive glass of wine. And when you're, when you're at Christmas lunch and you want to pull the big wine out for your uncle who's who's uh, shown you lots of big wines before and you want to pull another one out to show him, this would be certainly doing the job. Lots lots going on, lots going on indeed. Uh, this wine we rated at 93 points, so that's a really lovely silver ribbon for this one. Um, it's still a top rank wine. It's number 27 of 116 Shirazes from 2018 from the Barossa Valley. And we talked about this one being the big one. I'd, I'd almost leave it till the end and have it with some cheese. Um, Reed's, Reed's suggestion is a cheese kransky, um, but specifically from uh, Link Central Butchers in uh, Nuri Uptua. So it depends whether you've got access to those or not. Um, but we're both on the cheese sort of bandwagon, I suppose. So um, I'll let you go and see Reed and get one of those kranskis and see how he goes for that or get maybe some set up for Christmas. Maybe that's the, maybe that's the trick. Now, I'm gonna take a few questions here. I've got a little more time. Um, so let's, there we go. Terence, how has Chardonnay changed over the years in Australia? I've heard the term modern Chardonnay. What does that mean? Right, well, Chardonnay's probably gone the, gone the biggest change, I think, of any wine style in Australia in the past uh, 20 years. If we go back to or even longer than that. If we go back to the Chardonnays that we were making in the sort of 90s, they were, they were a deep golden colour on release. They were very buttery. Buttery was the term. Everyone loved a big buttery Chardonnay. They were very, very rich, very oaky, um, quite frankly, quite flabby. And you, you couldn't help but admire a glass of it because there was so much going on. But it was actually, they were almost syrupy and sweet. And then we've seen... Uh, a sort of, I suppose, a reaction to that. The pendulum swings and everyone wanted, everyone jumped on the ABC, the anything but Chardonnay bandwagon and uh, ran off to Sauvignon Blanc predominantly. And so then the Chardonnay producers got left behind and then they've started working towards and they started, there was a big push towards unwooded Chardonnays, which didn't really tick the box because Chardonnay is a variety that does need some winemaker influence to really, to really sing. And now we've seen what we call the modern day Chardonnays. So the modern day Chardonnays are the wines of the past 10 or 15 years that are more elegant, more food friendly, um, more just consumer friendly as well. There's a, there's a brightness and a freshness and a, a lightness to them. They have not been overworked in any one direction. I suppose it's about balance really, about making sure that all the components keep it singing. Um, Hewan. Uh, do you think Giant Steps being sold to Jackson family will make any differences? 
Um, look, the Jackson family, um, based in California, obviously they've they've been buying up quite a few wineries around the place. They own Yangara down in uh, McLaren Vale, and um, they own several wineries in the the state. I think they're they're certainly their aiming is always for quality, and they've got they've got a real passion for quality wines. I think it'll be interesting to see how they go whether Steve Flamsteed stays there. Obviously, Steve's been at um, Giant Steps for a very long time, and he knows the place. So, winemaker change is probably more of a more of a factor than the ownership change as such. I suppose time will tell. Uh, ben, um, I read about Pinot Noir not aging as well as the Shirazes. What's your take on this? Um, Probably as a rule of thumb, yes, that's about right. Um, Pinot Noirs can age fantastically. Um, one of the greatest wines I've ever tried was, uh, at the time was, I can't do the maths, but it was about 40 years old. And um, that was a Burgundian Pinot Noir. So probably a bit more structured than a lot of Australian ones, but it was a fantastic wine. I've drunk amazing Shirazes at the same age as well. Really, it depends on the style of wine that's made whether it's got those structural components to help it age. Um, so I didn't really answer your question, but as a, as a rule of thumb, Shiraz tends to have a bit more structure, so it might age a little, little bit longer. Um, another question from Ben, which is I've, one of my favorite ones, is Pinot Noir better drunk in a colder temperature? Um, I think you're talking about the temperature of the wine we're drinking, not the temperature of the room that we're in. Um, I'm going to work with that anyway. Uh, yes, the short answer is yes. Australia, we drink our wine at room temperature, but quite often our room temperature is in sort of the mid 20s. And I don't think that suits Pinot Noir. Um, we drink our whites too cold as well, but that's a story for another day. I like Pinot Noir around that 17 to 18 degrees, Mark. Um, if I'm organised, I put it in the fridge for half an hour before I have a glass. If I'm not organised and I'm in a hurry, I might even pop, God forbid, an ice cube in it. Uh, because a good Pinot Noir, one ice cube's not going to really be detrimental to the, the quality of the wine, but it will bring it. You'll get more good than bad from it. I'm sure there's lots of people shaking their head at me right now, but that's okay. I can live with it. And... I'm going to take one more question because Ben's really been on the questions, which is great. Um, my take, what's my take on Cabernet from Margaret River compared to Coonawarra? Uh, I love them both. I really do. But they are de definitely distinct beasts. Margaret River gives a much more generous, probably a more opulent style. Um, what I would what I would say a bigger, richer style as a rule. And once again, I'm painting with a very broad brush in this regard. And um, Kunawara tends to be a little bit lighter, a little bit more structured, a little more lithe. So my, my decisions between those two wines, those two regions would be very much based on whether I'm what I'm eating. So a big beef dish, I'd probably go Margaret River, sort of more like lamb. I might go something like a Coonawarra Cabernet. And that's how I fall on those anyway. Have we got time for one more? Why not? Okay. Actually, I'm not sure I've got another one. There we go. I can see on the other one that uh, Dan, who hasn't popped his up, started an, about pairing with a Big Mac. Well, mate, I think champagne goes with a Big Mac, but we didn't have champagne or a Big Mac, so we'll <laughs> maybe we'll try that later. Um, James, we always start Christmas lights with a sparkling burgundy, usually black Shiraz from Rockford. Uh, do you follow this tradition? And if so, what is your sparkling of choice? Um, sparkling Shiraz, I actually generally finish with it quite often. Um, by the time... When I was talking about the the Kaisel here with cheese, actually, I like a, I actually love a sparkling Shiraz with cheese as well. That's a really good one. I tend to stick to the um, the white sparkling to start when I'm when I'm doing that. Um, the Rockford Basket Press though is one of my favourites. Absolutely one of my favourites. Um, I'm a big fan of the Sevilt's Great Western wines as well. And uh, there's. Um, Oh, there's another one which is escaping me now. Oh, Glandor Estate from the Hunter Valley have done a one-off sparkling Shiraz. Worth checking out. I'm not even sure if they've got any more, but it's a cracking wine. Uh, 
Sparkling Shiraz with bacon is always a winning combination though, Robert, I agree. Okay, guys. Well, thank you very much for joining in and uh, listening to me. And I hope you learned something and I got you, I hope you got something for your Christmas day. And uh, thank you very much and have a good night. <laughs>